is Mackenzie, and so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, different functions that flowering habitats can serve. I'm also going to talk a little bit about my field research. Um, and then lastly, I'm just going to finish up with some considerations about um, if you were thinking about planting a flower, flowering habitat, just some places to start. Um, so to get started, we already kind of heard a little bit about this, but um, firstly, what is a flowering habitat? And to put it simply, it's just a place where flowers have been planted, and it's generally um, a mix of flower species. Um, and these can be really flexible in their implementation. Um, in terms of size, they can range from a small patch to an entire field. Some people plant them in strips, either on as like a border around their field or interspersed within their fields. Um, and some people also will plant them in unused pivot corners, um, if that's the case. And so these factors really just depend on um, your space and management preferences. So why do we? Why would we include flowering habitats? Um, why do we care about them? And so the cool thing about these habitats is though, while they might be planted for one purpose, um, they can often serve multiple functions. So to start with, um, they can support pollinators like we just heard about by providing food. Um, they also have the potential to improve biological control by supporting natural enemies of some of our agricultural pests, which we'll get into a lot more later. Um, they have the potential um, to help out with soil conservation by creating wind, or water breaks or anchoring in soil. They can also help with water regulation, and that's kind of what this photo shows here, where a habitat has been planted on the banks of an irrigation ditch to slow runoff and act as a filter strip. Um, and then lastly, aesthetics, they can be pleasing to look at. Um, so as Brian mentioned, I work mostly with insects, so we are gonna focus on these first two points and I'm going to start off uh, and talk a little bit about pollinators. So pollinators are important for a number of reasons. In the wild, they pollinate wild crops, which is, or wild plants, uh, which is critical for the reproduction of those plants, but also for the food that those plants produce for wildlife. Um, this includes seeds or berries that um, animals and birds um, need to survive. <coughs> <coughs> they are also extremely important for crop pollination and our food system, which I'm sure most of you are already aware of. Um, pollination is required for most of our fruits, vegetables, um, nuts, our seed crops, um, fibers, medicines, you name it. And so, more recently, these the importance of these pollination services has been increasingly focused on with the decline in honeybees um, from colony collapse disorder. And so this decline in honeybees has um, increased our interest in supporting not only honeybees, but also other pollinators. And um, so I included a couple pictures of some native pollinators here, but as you can see, the walls are filled with them and there are more outside. So, um, whether or not we want to support honeybees or native pollinators, what do we need to provide for them in terms of a habitat? And most importantly, it's food. Um, and their two major food sources are pollen and nectar. Pollen is important because it is their major source of protein. It also has some sugars in there, vitamins and minerals, and fatty acids. Um, nectar, on the other hand, is more of a carbohydrate food source. It is packed with sugars. And both of these foods are used to feed um, their brood or their young and to help them survive the winter. Back to this list again, we're going to switch gears and start talking about how flowering habitats might improve biological control. So firstly, what is biocontrol? Some of you might already be familiar with it, um, but the general premise is that we use a group of insects <coughs> called natural enemies um, to control pest insects either by eating them or parasitizing them. Um, and this, in turn, should um, prevent losses to our crop plants. Um, and that's kind of what this figure shows here. Um, so pests have a negative in, uh, impact on crops um, by feeding on them or spreading disease. Natural enemies have a negative effect on pests 
um, by eating them or parasitizing them. And therefore, increased natural enemy, should, enemy activity should have an overall uh, positive impact on crop plants. So, in a nutshell, biocontrol is the control of one insect by these other insects. And we call these other insects who do the dirty work for us, biocontrol <coughs> agents, or as we've been saying, natural enemies. And there's these two groups of natural enemies that we're gonna go over some examples of. Uh, predators, who are natural enemies that consume their prey. Um, and there are many types of insects that are natural enemies, including some non-insects, like spiders. And parasitoids are another type of natural enemy. Um, and these are parasites that kill their hosts in the process of parasitism. And these are usually tiny wasps, but there can be other types of parasitoids as well. So now we're just gonna go through some quick examples of some uh, commonly found natural enemies. First up are predators with piercing sucking mouth parts. And this really just means that they have a straw-like mouth that they stick into their prey and suck the juices out. Um, so, um, so they prefer soft-bodied insects that they can easily pierce uh, with their mouth parts, um, like aphids. But they'll also feed on the um, eggs and larvae of other pest insects, so pretty much anything soft that they can get their mouth into. Um, so first up are big-eyed bugs, and these guys are generalist predators, so they eat a wide range of things, um, but when their prey is scarce, they will also eat um, nectar when they can't have any prey. Um, and these here are damsel bugs, which are another generalist predator. Um, and this is what the adult looks like, and this is an immature. Next up are predators with chewing mouth parts, which I think we're all a little more familiar with. Um, and this is here is a lady beetle adult, and the lady beetle larvae, which, which people aren't necessarily always so familiar with because it looks a little out there. Um, and so, both of these guys are voracious eaters. They eat a lot of soft-bodied insects, including aphids, like you can see this guy here. And um, lady beetles, a lady beetle in its lifetime can eat up to 5,000 aphids, throw from larval stage through adults, so they eat a lot. But lady beetles, just like our big, big eye bugs, will also eat pollen and nectar um, when prey is scarce or just as an alternate food source. Lace wings are another commonly found predator that have chewing mouth parts. Again, that's what the adult looks like, and there's a larva eating aphids. Um, and again, these guys will also eat nectar. While they're predaceous, they'll still eat nectar as well. Lastly are the parasitoids. So like I said, these guys are usually tiny wasps, um, and so they kill their host in the process of parasitism. So both of these guys, or ladies, I should say, are um, laying their eggs inside a host. So aphid and this little green guy here, I'm not sure what that is. Um, and what will happen is those wasp eggs will eventually hatch out of, out of their host, and the wasp larvae will consume the host that they were just living inside. So effectively um, killing uh, the host insect. So while the larvae are predaceous, um, the adults actually rely solely either on floral nectar or the honeydew produced by aphids. So for them, having an alternate food source besides their prey is very important. So, as we just learned, um, a lot of natural enemies require um, nectar or pollen as an alternative food source. So, in creating an alternative habitat to support them, um, including floral resources that produce nectar, um, is key. Besides nectar, providing refuge from disturbance is another key um, to a floral habitat for supporting <coughs> natural enemies. So from an insect's perspective, our crop fields are frequently disturbed by just normal management practices, like cutting for hay, um, tillage, spraying, excuse me, um, harvesting. And so having a nearby place where natural enemies can escape to during these disturbances allows them the place to hang out um, until it's safe to go back. And then lastly, some natural enemies need a place to overwinter and spend the winter. Um, and for some, this is in leaf litter on the ground. In others, it just means they need some standing 
uh, vegetation for protection. Um, so if you leave a flowering habitat unmowed through the winter, it can also provide an overwintering habitat for your natural enemies. So now that we've just talked about biological control and floral habitats, I'm going to talk a little bit about my project, which is the biological control of alfalfa weevil. And so, um, if you grow forage alfalfa, um, then you might know that alfalfa weevil is one of the biggest pests for hay growers. Um, this is what the adult looks like um, in the larva right there. And it's actually the larvae that do most of the damage by chewing on the leaves. And heavy infestations of larva um, can leave a field looking skeletonized and reduce yields. So, current methods of control that some producers might use for weevil management um, include spraying, uh, which can sometimes be too costly, or they'll make the first cut early because alfalfa weevil is an early season pest. Um, but this sometimes isn't always effective. It can be hard for larger operations to time correctly. Um, and sometimes it can still cause damage on the second cutting when the alfalfa weevil moves through the windrow and start feeding on the secondary growth. Um, so these are just some of the options and trade-offs that we can use to manage people. So what about biological control? Um, so besides pests, there are also a bunch of those natural enemies that we just went over that are in our alfalfa fields. So damselbugs, lady beetles, lacewings, and parasitoids. And my research is focused on this parasitoid wasp right here um, and its potential for maybe controlling alfalfa. So alfalfa weevil has been a problem in the region for a long time, and this wasp was first introduced in 1911 in Utah to try and control the problem. Um, and since then, it has spread throughout the region, including throughout Wyoming. Um, however, the last time it was surveyed for was a little over 20 years ago, and so the first steps for this project was to see A, is um, this parasitoid still around, and B, if so, to what extent is it parasitizing alfalfa weevil. So last spring in 2014, we set out to see just what was going on. Um, and so in southeastern Wyoming, we swept uh, 14, uh, 10 alfalfa fields. Um, and that's Matt, our intern last year, and we just used a sweep net to collect alfalfa weevil larvae. Uh, we brought them back to the lab where we reared them to adulthood to see how many of them had been parasitized. Um, and this was our data from last year. Um, and this is a map. So for reference, here is Wheatland, Torrington's over there, and on the far edge is the Nebraska border. And the white numbers on here are percentages of parasitism. And so we found a really variable parasitism rate from 7 to 34 percent. Um, and we also noticed that parasitism rates tended to be grouped somewhat spatially. So there's lower parasitism over here and higher parasitism over on the side. Um, so this led us to our next question, why is parasitism so variable and low in places? And what could we do to um, increase parasitism to better control alfalfa? So knowing that these parasitoids um, need floral nectar to survive, when we were out sampling last spring, um, we noticed that a lot of our producer fields either within the field or around the edges, had a lot of flowering weeds, like mustard, shepherd's purse, and dandelion. So this led us to the question, could flowering weeds in or around producer fields um, be supporting parasitism? And so we don't know the answer yet. Um, this year, we increased our sampling to 24 fields down in the southeast and included 18 fields up in the Bighorn Basin. And when we did that sampling, we tried to quantify the amount of blooming weeds that we saw. Um, but that was only a couple weeks ago, so we don't have any data on that quite yet. So at the same time that we were doing that sampling last year, we also established um, this field experiment to see whether or not intentionally, fla if intentionally flowered, uh, planted flowering strips could enhance uh, parasitism or support parasitoids. And so, um, the experiment just pretty much consists of plots of alfalfa with adjacent strips of flowers. And so you can see us over here, that was us planting last June, um, and this is what the strips looked like at the end of last summer. 
and um, so for this we're mainly interested in comparing um, insect preferences between the different habitats and so we have two different kinds of flowering strips we have an annual flowering strip and a native perennial flowering strip and we use a leaf blower that has been put in reverse to essentially vacuum um, the insects from these different habitats so annual perennial or the crop habitat um, and we're just looking for differences uh, between those so last year was an establishment year and so we didn't actually get to start sampling until the very end of the year um, so we have some very preliminary data this is just a snapshot um, of some of the insect things that we found so this top graph here is lady beetle abundance and you can see that there are more lady beetles found in the flowering strips which are the annual and perennial bars than in the alfalfa uh, which is their uh, crop habitat the amphibos if you remember are a generalist predator that we went over earlier and um, their abundance was much higher in the crop versus the flower strips so again this is preliminary data, but it did show us that there are some habitat preferences that these natural enemies have um, between the different habitat types. Um, and this can be important, especially if we look at the lady beetles, if they're being, if the flower strips are acting like a sink and the lady beetles are being pulled out of the crop into the flowering strips, um, then maybe that's not the most ideal. So anyway, these are things that we're hoping to learn a lot more this year. Um, and we're sampling every other week to try and get a better look at what's going on. So if you have more questions about my topic, um, my project, we can chat about that some more later. We're going to switch gears one last time and talk about, if you are interested in flowering strips, just what are some basic considerations to start thinking about. Um, so these are the ones we're going to go through, <coughs> looking at over time, considering native species, um, where to plant, um, and deciding on annuals or perennial flowers. So first up with bloom time, um, this is an example from um, Michigan blueberries. And so this big chunk of blue right here is the time when blueberries are in bloom in Michigan, and which is the time that we want our pollinators to be around to pollinate the crop. Um, and that's what this, these red lines show right here. They show the activity of these bees. And you can see that they're all active during the blueberry bloom, which is great. Um, but what about the rest of the season and all of this white space in between? So we know that pollinators and natural enemies rely on floral nectar, so it's important that they have these resources throughout the season. And it is possible to pick flower species that complement our crop and fill in those spaces in between. And something like a bloom calendar is really helpful for picking out those species. And this is a bloom calendar from a project at Montana State. Uh, the light green is the total bloom period for those flowers, and the dark green is peak bloom. Um, and these are all the native perennial flower species that they use for this. And so something like this can help you decide um, which flower species will complement your crop rather than compete with it. Next up is native species, um, which we already talked about a little, so sorry for the redundancy. Um, but why would you want to choose native flower species versus others? Um, firstly, if you're interested in supporting native, um, native pollinators or natural enemies, these insect groups, for the most part, are already somewhat adapted to our native flower species and will be ever better able to use them as food or refuge resources. Secondly, these plants are already adapted to Wyoming's climate for the most part. A lot of them are drought tolerant um, or do better at higher altitudes, and both of these factors will help them or help the success of your flower planting as a whole. Next up is location. Um, where would you want to plant these? Um, how close do they need to be your feet to your crop? Um, and this is still an area of a lot of research in terms of what is the most effective. Um, I think the first consideration should be what areas do you have that are currently unused? It's unlikely that you would um, take a, a productive piece of land out of crop production to plant a flower strip, um, although you may. Um, so thinking about places on the farm that you don't use um, might be the first place to start. 
Secondly is how close to your crop fields they need to be. And there have been some studies um, dealing with natural enemies and pest control that show that just by increasing um, the percentage of non-crop land around your crop can increase natural pest control. However, some natural enemies and pollinators might not move too far, so the closer the better, essentially. And then lastly, think about ease of management. While you might have a field border that you don't use, if you need that to turn around equipment, then maybe it's not the best or easiest place for you to put it. And then lastly, also related to management, is the use of annual or perennial flower species. Annual flowers will need to be established every year, which can take a lot of time. Um, some might uh, self-seed really well, so it might not be that much of a problem, but still things to think about. So, in general, annual flowers might be better for a temporary place, like as a cover crop or a field that will, might change usage from year to year. Perennials, on the other hand, are much more, or come back every year and would be much better for a more permanent planting that you plan on having for a while. Um, however, these guys do take longer to, be, to get established, and they may not flower the first year. Um, so, I just have just a quick little list of resources um, that could be helpful. This is actually put out by the University of Wyoming Biodiversity Institute, Plants with Altitude, and just, um, they have a website here, um, which is, um, they have a lot of great info on native plants that do well here. Um, second is the Xerxes Society, uh, which was mentioned, and they have a really great website, xerxes.org, with tons of resources on it. They also have two books, one about attracting native pollinators, and the other one about farming with native beneficial insects, so they talk a lot about natural enemies um, and stuff like that. And lastly, pollinator.org, the pollinator partnership. If you just go in there and type in your zip code, um, they will give you um, plant suggestions based on your region. So it's kind of neat. Anyway, so thank you all very, very much. Flowers on the side strips. Have you investigated about having the flowers be located in the intercom? Yeah, and so, um, yes, so there is a problem sometimes where it's actually um, self seeding flowers. Um, so a lot of people suggest um, mowing of like a strip between flowers and crops, so maybe not having them right on top of each other, but having like a little bit of order. Um, to right.